And I'm so glad y'all are here today. I said all of that to say, I'm so glad to see you here. I came with a great expectation in my heart about what God's going to do in your life and in all our lives. So I want you to get your Bibles out. Turn with me to the book of John, to the book of John, chapter 18. I'm going to read quite a few verses today, and we'll try not to take too long in preaching them, but I want you to hear the story, not as I would tell it, but as John told it. Is that all right? We pick up the story here. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, so that's where we're at. Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and, he and his disciples entered, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, pay attention here. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him. I, I'm, I'm going to repeat that just so I know everybody heard it. Jesus, therefore, knowing. Yeah, help me preach. Jesus, therefore, knowing that would come upon him, went forward. How about if I said he stepped forward? Let me put it this way. Bottom of the ninth, bases loaded, full count. Everybody expecting Jesus to hit it out of the park. And when they thought the game was over, man would tell you he struck out. Knowing that was going to be the story, he stepped up to the plate anyhow. Uh, maybe, maybe you don't identify with that one. Let's try this. 0.3 seconds on the clock. The game is tied. You're stepping up to the free throw line with the ball in your hand and the opportunity to win. Knowing all things, knowing that everybody would think he missed the gimme. He stepped up anyhow. He said to them, whom are you seeking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Now just come on. Now let's just get in this story for a minute. Can you use your imagination with me today? Is it all right if we use our imagination? Put yourself in the garden. Did you get the picture? Judas has Roman soldiers with him. They have lanterns to make sure they can see clearly. They have weapons to make sure that if it's going to be a knockdown, drag out, physical fight, that they're going to win. Is somebody with me? And they look and they say, who do you look? Jesus, knowing all things. Who are you looking for? In other words, he already knew. They were looking for him. He stepped up to the front of the pack. He looked at Peter, James, and John and said, I got this. This one's on me. Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I've told you. I'm he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. I skipped a bunch of verses there. Can I just go back to verse 5? Because I missed an important part. Jesus said, I am he, and Judas who betrayed him also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Yeah, yeah, we'd put it, they done got slain in the Holy Ghost right there. Come on, Jesus could have thrown down and said, let's just have church up in here. Give me a B3. Let's start running around this garden. Right on cue. <laughs> How many of you know that was his out right there? 
I said, that was his out right there. They were out. He said to somebody, pick him up, Holy Spirit, pick him up. <laughs> Only a few of you got that, right? <laughs> In pure Benny Hinn fashion, pick him up, pick him up, pick him up. <laughs> Come on, we're going to have fun on Easter Sunday morning because we won. <laughs> They drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again after they got up. Come on, who you seeking? Jesus, I told you I'm he. Therefore, let these go their way. Verse 10, then Simon Peter. Like, what was wrong with Simon, right? It's amazing how in our human intellect we rationalize things as if he didn't get, if Jesus wanted to get away when they all fell to the ground, that was their opportunity. Right? So now he, he, in all his zealousness, in human effort, pulls his sword out to say, all right, Jesus, obviously you don't got this. You don't have this like you said. You, I got this. Right? Cuts off the, the ear. I, 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 what could Jesus have done right there? I mean, another getaway option. But Jesus, knowing all things that he was about to experience and what the story would be, picked up that ear and put it back on, healed him. Whew. How many know Jesus is still healing ears today? He's, he's still the same God. He's still opening blind eyes. He's still opening deaf ears. He's still healing the sick. He's still raising the dead. Is anybody with me this morning? He's, he's still the same God. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? I mean, like, if I'm one of those soldiers, I'm like, peace out, dude. This guy's... I mean, think about it. He didn't run when they fell down. He healed an ear that was cut off. At what point did they not look at each other and say, he's the man? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to be that man, knowing all things that you would have to endure. You stepped up anyway. So speak to us in your word today. Open hearts. Declare today that dead people are coming to life again. In Jesus' name, somebody said, give somebody next to you a high five because we won. Because we won. On May 2nd, 2020, which if you do the calculation, would have been in the middle of quarantine. At, get this. You're going to think I make this up, but then some of you will Google me and find out I'm accurate. At Thor's Power Gym, a man named Hofbor Julius Bjornsson in Iceland stepped up behind a bar like this, except almost 10 times the weight was on the bar. And just in case you don't know, this is 135 pounds. There's 90 pounds worth of weight, 45 pounds worth of barbell here. So this is just a measly 135 pounds that took two men to bring up on the stage today. <laughs> but he stepped up not to 135 pounds, he actually stepped up to 501 kilograms, which would be 1,104.5 pounds. Over half a ton. And he stepped up to that bar that had that much weight on it. And I would step up to that bar this morning, but there's two reasons I won't. Number one, I wore my one and only suit. So I can't afford to have it rip. 
And number two, I promised my wife I wouldn't, and that one's more important. <laughs> but he stepped up to that 1,104.5 pounds to perform a movement known as a deadlift. A deadlift. See, see, some of you are like, Pastor Ryan, when are you going to get rid of the weight? So if you don't know, we're in, we're, God's speaking to us all this year about pressing new weights. So we've seen these weights on the stage a few times, and it's fitting for today, so we're going to use them again, all right? So, so, so he stepped up to perform a deadlift. A deadlift is when the weight would all be on the ground like that, and you would grab like this and just perform a movement, just a simple stand up to here, and that is the completed movement. It's called a deadlift, a deadlift. And he did that with 1,104.5 pounds. That's more weight than I care to think about. And as I thought about this movement, the, the, the name of the movement intrigued me, especially since we were upon Easter time. So I did a little research and there are several different stories out there about where this movement derived its name from. But possibly the first tale of what could be considered a deadlift comes from the 6th century BC on the Greek island of Thera. Archaeologists stumbled upon an unearthed massive boulder. Some of you are already figuring out where I'm going with this. That's all right. You can shout amen once you got it figured out. They noticed that the boulder had an inscription on it and read a man's name, Eumastus, the son of Critobulus lifted me from the ground. That's what the inscription read on this huge boulder. It's rumored that Eumastus had hoisted the boulder to hip height, though we don't have any concrete evidence of him lifting this said boulder. That is the tale that comes and that from which we derive this deadlift movement that this Mr. Bjornsson in Thor's gym in Iceland stepped up to in the middle of quarantine and set what is now the Guinness Book of World Records for the deadlift. He stepped up and in the garden, we just read that Jesus, knowing the weight of what was before him, stepped up. But ladies and gentlemen, he did not step up to a barbell with weights on it. He stepped up, knowing he would carry the weight of a cross. He stepped up knowing he would carry the weight of the cross. He was unafraid to step up and seize the moment, knowing that it was for this purpose that the Son of God had been manifest, and that before him stood the opportunity to destroy Every work of the devil, the work of the devil that began in a garden. We sang about how God turns graves into gardens, but before <laughs> graves ever became gardens, gardens became graves. <laughs> because in the beginning, we read that there was a garden and it was beautiful and it was exactly the way God had put it together until man decided that the one thing, come on, how many know Adam and Eve didn't have it difficult? I mean, there's, they could, you can do anything except one thing. I mean, we, they didn't have all the laws to deal with. Moses' law hadn't been given. Come on. They didn't have to worry about how many days before they could wash their hands and be purified and go back into the temple. They didn't have any of that to worry about. They didn't have to worry about what they would see when they turned on television that would pollute their minds. They, they, they didn't have, come on, are y'all with me today? They weren't worried that they'd go to the doctor and be given prescription medicines that they could become addicted to. They, 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 there was not the concern in the garden that children would grow up having been abused and misused and not know what a loving family was like. Until just this one thing they had to worry about. Like enjoy everything here except one thing. This tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we know the story, right? Uh, uh, the serpent, the devil, so cunning. Come on, if you, gee, God doesn't want you to do this because he knows if you'll just partake of this tree, you'll be like him. 
The biggest lie because they already were like him. They were made in his image. <laughs> they were already made in his image. And of course we know instead of choosing to continue to eat from the tree of life, they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And now they were actually awakened to evil. What happened was that the nature of sin entered into the human race. And we read in the New Testament that because sin came through Adam and we all came from Adam, that all of us are born with a nature a tendency towards sin. That's why you never have to teach a kid to lie. You don't have to teach a kid to obey. You actually have to train them into righteousness. Because the nature that we come into the world with is a nature towards sin. Are you all with me today? Which means we're all born in need of a savior. Romans put it this way. The wages of this sin is Help me preach. The wages of sin is, in other words, the wages, the weight of sin is a weight too big for any human to ever be able to lift. Because it, all the end of sin is, is dead. And it's a dead lift you could never hoist. Because it's the weight of sin. But Jesus, knowing all of human history and that the only hope for mankind to be restored to the Father in the garden, when they came and said, who are you looking for? He said, I'm the man. Boom. Pick him up. Who are you looking for again? Jesus, that's me. I told you already. Quack, nope, healed. He stepped up, he seized the moment. Other times, see, see, here's how we know he gave his life and nobody took it. Because there were other times they came looking for Jesus and they had every opportunity and the Bible says he vanished and disappeared from their midst. This time, he had opportunity to leave and he stayed in the game. He, he, he said, I, I'm fixing to do this. I got this. I got this for all of humanity that has lived up until now. I got this for those that would be sitting at 11735 Plantation Road, Fort Myers, Florida on April 4th, 2021. Many of you already believers, but maybe some in the house that have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. He stepped up in that moment and don't let anybody tell you that they killed him. He gave his life because he could have left, but he stayed there because he had you on his mind. He had you on his mind. He stepped up to the weight. Not only did he step up to the weight, but if you go on to verse 17 of, of John chapter 18, we pick up the story. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 19. Let's get down to verse 19. Nope, that's not what I want. I done put all the wrong scripture verses in there. Hallelujah. It's because it's supposed to be 1917. That's why. 1917. So it's all going to be wrong on the screen, and that's my fault. Typo in my notes. Hallelujah. Will y'all forgive me on Easter Sunday morning? Thank you. Chapter 19, verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, let me say this, pressing the weight of the cross went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place uh, where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I've written, I've written. In other words, it's done. You can't change it now. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic and the tunic was without seam, woven from top in one piece. How many of you know Jesus had some mighty fine threads on? 
if they're gambling for it at the cross. Down in verse 28, the Bible picks it up. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on his hip and put it in his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So, so let me just paint this picture because Jesus, we know, had to carry the cross from uh, where he had been sentenced to the place where the execution would be carried out at Golgotha, the place that is the place of the skull. And we know he had to bear that weight, but it's important to understand that Pilate trying to figure out for what reason they were really crucifying him because the custom of the day that was there would be an inscription upon the cross above the head of the person who was being executed and what would be on that inscription is the crime for which they were being executed. But Pilate couldn't find any reason. All he knew was the accusation that came from the Jewish people. So on that inscription prophetically he wrote in three languages so that anybody there in the day, if you don't get the first, you're going to get the second. And if you don't get the first and second, you're going to get the third because it was Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Jesus, King of the Jews. In other words, Pilate's like, man, he's not guilty of anything. All I know is what they're saying. So let's just add that weight to the cross, the guilty verdict and the reason he's being hung. So Jesus was hung from a tree because he was who he said he was. Because he was who he said he was. And the writing above verified that, hey man, we've searched. All we can figure out is this guy must be who he, they say he is and who he says he is. So he carried his cross with the conviction nailed to it that was known to man at that time. But he stepped up and ensuring that every prophetic word was fulfilled from all the Old Testament prophets. Made sure that he partook of that vinegar and that sour wine because it was prophesied that he would. And when it was done, I, I could go into all the symbolism. I'm not going to take time for that today. Only you C's would like it, you know, you people that like all the facts and stuff. Knowing that it was done. First of all, in the garden, knowing what was about to happen. He completed the deadlift. And he gave up his spirit. All of these things highlight the fact that nobody took Jesus' life. He surrendered himself and he surrendered his spirit. He stepped up to the weight. He pressed the weight of the cross. And there it was, the bottom of the ninth. There it was, the last second of the game. And all of hell thought it was over. All of humanity thought it was over. The disciples were mourning. Mary, his mother, was crying, trying to be comforted. It's impossible to comfort a mother in that moment. Everybody thought it was over. Disciples are running. Joseph of Arimathea takes the body down, puts the body without spirit, without soul, now lifeless, no blood flowing through it at that moment, puts it in the grave after it had been prepared properly for burial. And the Bible tells us that the Romans and everybody and the chief priests, they were worried about a conspiracy. Not that we would ever have conspiracy theories to deal with or worry about, I have no idea 
why they were concerned about conspiracies back then, because we know in 2021, we don't have any conspiracies at all. They said, you know what, let's just, let's just make double sure. Let's, let's put a big old stone in front of that grave and seal it. And that's not good enough. Let's put a guard there to make sure. So we're going to make sure that social media can't come up with a conspiracy theory. In John chapter 20, we read that there was a lady that was the first to the tomb. I'm going to say that again. There was a lady that was the first to the tomb. There was a lady that took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but there was a lady that was the first to the tomb. There was a lady that was the first one to see the risen Savior. It's, it's, uh, somebody just needs to know that's insi- that is not insignificant. It's very significant. So don't tell me women can't preach when the first ones to hear the gospel message were women. Don't tell me that something important didn't happen when it was the woman who first partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but it was a woman who first heard the good news of how what happened in the garden. Alongside a grave, a grave was turned into a garden. Life came back again. Very significant. Not only was it significant that it was a woman, but let's remember the state of that woman. It was Mary Magdalene. It was a prostitute, a whore, a slut. Whatever word offends you the most, I'll use it this morning so you understand this isn't just a pretty little Bible message. This was a woman who sold her body so men could get whatever they get out of that. Pastor Ryan, are you talking like, yeah, I am. Can we just tell the story the way it really is and not put a nice little bow on it so we don't get offended? Not only was she a prostitute, the Bible said he, Jesus had cast out seven demons from her. She was a demon-possessed whore. And you think your stuff's too bad for Jesus. And you think he could never save you where you're at. Come on, we're not reading a little pretty Bible story. We're reading something where Jesus came into contact with people that had real problems in their life, that had real sin issues in their life. And he looked at him and said, I don't care how bad you've been. There ain't nothing that's going to keep my love away from you. There's nothing that can keep you away from the Father because I'll step up to the weight of the cross. I'll perform a deadlift. Not only will I perform a deadlift and I'll carry the weight of your sin, but when that boulder is put in front of the tomb. I'll make everyone know that there is no grave that can hold back the power of resurrection life. So in a, in a Romanian deadlift, the movement is not completed until the bar comes up to hip height and you stand up straight and the judge nods his head and you can drop it again. Ladies and gentlemen, the movement wasn't complete when he breathed his last on the cross and said it is finished. But on that resurrection Sunday morning, hey, hey, I'm about to preach in here this morning. On that resurrection Sunday morning, when that tomb was rolled away, when that heavy boulder that had been sealed rolled away from the tomb and he stepped out, the deadlift was completed to let all humanity know no sin, no death, no hell, no grave can keep back the power of the resurrected son of Jesus Christ. Of course, Mary Magdalene went and he got Peter and John. Peter and John ran and the Bible says they got into the empty tomb and they look and there were the grave clothes folded nice and neat like, it's all done. Jesus was a good man. He made the bed when he got out of it. <laughs> I got women nudging their husbands. See, you need to be more like Jesus. My problem is I'm still not sure I'm alive when I get out of bed in the morning. Just, gotta wait a few minutes. Yeah. 
But let's, let's, let's be clear about something. Let's be really clear about something. The weight that Jesus pressed on the cross, let's be sure, the title of my message, I'll give it to you now, is the greatest deadlift. It was the greatest deadlift. 1,104.5 pounds has nothing to what Jesus lifted. But the weight isn't just represented in, it's not just represented in uh, the weight of the wood of the cross that Jesus carried. It's not just represented in the pain of the lashes on his back from the whip that they scourged him with. It's not just measured or weighed in the agony of having his beard plucked from his face, of having his cheeks bruised with the fist of men as they mocked him and enduring the mocking of him. It's not just measured in the pain from when they took the crown of thorns and pressed it on his head and blood flowed. It's not measured in the agony of probably death by suffocation that most criminals suffered when they were executed in this manner. It's not measured in the pain of having his nails, his hands pierced with nails, his feet pierced with nails. It's a whole lot more than just what his physical body suffered because on that cross, he didn't just press the way he endured, he pressed the weight you could never endure. He pressed the weight you could never carry. He pressed the weight man was never designed to carry. It's the weight that would result in the punishment of sin that would exist apart from the work of Jesus at Calvary. Colossians tells us about that. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation because it puts it in just such vivid picture for us. This realm of death, Colossians 2.13, describes our former state. For we were held in sin's grasp. Does anybody have that testimony today? Wave your hand. You were held in sin's grasp. But now we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return. For we are forever li alive and forgiven of all of our sins. At any time you want, you can shout if you're thankful for that. <laughs> He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record. And the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross. Wait a second. Hear this now. Everything we were, everything you were in your old nature that identified with Adam where you sinned and you couldn't help it because it was just the power that was at work in you. It's been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. All right, before I read the rest of it, let me just give you a picture. If you remember, there was an inscription that was nailed to the cross and probably placed above Jesus' head, and it said, King of the Jews. But what people didn't see when they read that inscription in three languages is that also nailed there at the same time was the guilty verdict of your addiction, the guilty, uh, the guilty verdict of your perversion, the guilty verdict of your lying, the guilty verdict of your cheating, the guilty verdict of your stealing, the guilty verdict of whatever sin used to reside in your life. When that inscription was nailed, Colossians tells us our guilty verdict was nailed there with him. They didn't see it then, 
But Paul's saying, I got revelation that what they saw nailed to the cross was just a little bit of what was actually nailed there. Here's why. Because when the person hanging under that reason for conviction died, then penalty was paid in full. Then penalty was paid in full. And it was then canceled. So when Jesus said, all right, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. Your conviction and the penalty for it was paid in full. And therefore, you can live free from that conviction because it was paid and now canceled. That's what Colossians is telling us. Somebody ought to get excited about that this morning. But it gets better. It gets gooder and gooder. It just keeps getting better. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all, in other words, he shamed them, of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. So that you are not sin's prisoner. Sin is his prisoner. And you're free today. Why? Because he completed the deadlift when he got up out of the grave so that you and I can live. That's the message of Easter. We find all kinds of different ways to say it every Easter, right? But the good news is still, Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. And I'm free, somebody say free, from sin. That means what used to hold me can't hold me anymore. Because what held me was nailed to the cross. And when Jesus got off the cross, what? What had me stayed there. What had me stayed there. So we're free today. So the good news, just in case you need to hear it this morning, is this. Yeah, the truth, sin separates man from God. And God was never willing to let sin stay in the middle of he and his creation. So what man gave up in the garden, man had to get back in the grave. I'm gonna say it this way. Man had to take back in the grave. So Jesus coming as a man, living a perfect life free from sin, took back victory over death, hell, and the grave. That's why The grave couldn't hold him because the power of the grave is found in sin, but there was no sin in him. So man who introduced sin into the world through Adam, through the man Jesus introduced back into the world was the possibility of life, life, life. How do we receive this life? I knew you were going to ask that question. So I pre-prepared the answer. It's simply by choosing to make Jesus, the one who died for you and rose again, the Lord of your life by confessing him as your Lord and surrendering your life to him. You don't have to clean up. Mary Magdalene didn't clean up before Jesus delivered her. Mary Magdalene didn't get it cleaned up before Jesus forgave her and set her free. And she was the first to hear the good news. So you don't have to leave here today and go fix anything in your life. All you need to do is make the simple decision to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You don't have to join, listen, you don't have to join a church. 
simply choosing to believe in him, surrender to him as Lord, and he'll come and he'll live on the inside of you. You'll receive his kind of resurrection life and he'll restore you to relationship with the Father. Here's the good news, God's not mad at you today. I don't care how much you've messed up, God's not mad at you, but he is madly in love with you. That's why he's made available to you this incredible free gift in Christ Jesus today. The Bible says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. With the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So today I'm gonna to give somebody the opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Would everybody just close your eyes with me wherever you're at? And I could be talking to people that are gathering with us online. I could be talking to people in this room today. I don't know who you are, but Jesus knows who you are. And I believe in this moment, you know Jesus is speaking to you because if you feel something going on the inside of you and you're not sure what that is, chances are that's the goodness of God and the power of his spirit convincing you of his goodness and drawing you to himself. And he's inviting you into relationship with him. And you can simply respond to his call upon your heart today by saying, yes, Jesus, I want to make you the Lord of my life. I want to receive the forgiveness of sin. I want to come into relationship with God through Christ Jesus, this God that loves me like this crazy guy on the platform is telling me about. So if that's you and you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life on this Easter Sunday morning and you want to receive new life today, would you just lift up your hand wherever you're at in this room? Just lift up your hand. Say, today I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. Don't hesitate. Just lift up your hand right now. I'm going to wait for just a minute. Is there anybody in the sound of my voice? Mm. Hallelujah. I'm going to wait a minute because we've been praying for you today. Would you just lift up your hand, please? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Yeah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to ask everybody to pray this prayer after me. Maybe you're gathering with us online right now. Listen, you don't have to be in this room. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer from your heart along with the one that raised their hand in this room today to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Confess with your mouth. He is your Lord today. Would you pray with me, everybody? Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. You died for me. And you rose again. I surrender my life to you. This day, I choose you as my Lord. From this day forward, I'll serve you and I'll live for you. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me of my sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says that when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. In other words, now you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away, all things become new. I'll give you a chance to celebrate in just a minute. And now what? Now you live for him, you serve him, you get plugged in to a church, you fellowship with believers so that you can grow in your relationship with him because it's not a one-time commitment. The Bible says if you confess, and it really says it this way in the, the original language, if you confess and keep on confessing, and if you believe in your heart and keep on believing. So it's a continual progressive walk with Jesus. We welcome you into that and we declare over you today, you are what the Bible says you are. You are a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away. All things become new, and we celebrate this morning those that have come into newness of life. Would you just give thanks to Jesus for that? I want to do something. We want to receive communion today on this Easter Sunday. If you did not receive the emblems of communion when you came in this morning, would you just lift up your hand? 
And just have patience, leave your hand up until the ushers serve you, they'll get to you as quickly as possible. Yeah, thank you for lifting your hand. Just give them a minute, they'll get to you. They gotta climb stairs and get their workout in for the day. Amen. It was important for us to wait until after that opportunity for people to make Jesus the Lord of their life because at Life Church, we don't believe you have to be a member of Life Church to receive the emblems of communion. And we do believe it's vitally important that you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. That you live for him. That's a prerequisite we see in scripture for receiving these emblems of communion. And we know that what we do with this little styrofoam tasting wafer <laughs> is because Jesus on the night that he was betrayed was celebrating the Passover with his disciples, celebrating that moment when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, came out of bondage. And every time we gather around these emblems, it's an opportunity for us to remember that Jesus performed the greatest deadlift ever so we could be free from the bondage of sin. And the Bible says that on that night, Jesus was ready, he took bread and broke it. And now it's not just, you know, this wafer of unleavened bread, it's now this is my body that was broken for you. See, what we need to remember that the weight that Jesus pressed, the weight that Jesus carried on the cross was the weight of our sin, but it was also the weight that all of our sin produced because sin brought into the world things like sickness and disease. Things like the common cold and the flu and, oh yeah, coronavirus. <laughs> he carried the weight of that sickness and disease because the Bible says that it's by his stripes we were healed. His body was bruised, though there were no bones broken. That's what the Bible tells us. His body was broken. It was bruised and battered for our wholeness, our spirit, spiritual wholeness, for wholeness in our soul. Because the Bible says the chastisement for our peace was upon him. In other words, we don't have to live with anxiety and depression, sadness, heaviness. Because that was part of the curse. And on the cross, Jesus carried the weight of the curse so we could be free from the curse. So we could live life in peace and joy and righteousness. So his body was broken so we could be whole. Spirit, soul, and body. So today, we celebrate around these emblems of communion because of what happened at the cross. That it was more than enough. Debt paid in full and then some. Put this way. Debt paid in full and credit to your account. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We take this emblem in our hands. And we remember what Jesus did on that night that he was betrayed. When he allowed himself to be arrested, when he allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, when he himself gave up his spirit. And Jesus, we thank you that nobody took your life, but you willingly laid it down so that we could be whole. And Lord, I pray that in this moment, as we receive these emblems, that there's a work done in hearts, that the bruising of hearts would be supernaturally mended in this moment. As we've proclaimed the power of the cross, we don't just want to celebrate it without there being a demonstration of your power in the lives of people today. And we've seen it as people have surrendered their lives to you. But now, Lord, we believe for a supernatural work in hearts that heals broken hearts today, that releases peace over people, that depression actually destroyed today. Anxiety lifted. In Jesus' name. 
Lord, people healed in their physical bodies, free from insomnia, heart disease healed today in Jesus' name. Infections healed today in Jesus' name. Cancer healed today. Tumors falling off today in Jesus' name. Joints supernaturally restored. Bodies made whole today. <laughs> Autoimmune diseases annihilated because of the power of the cross today. Parkinson's healed today in Jesus' name. Blind see, deaf hear, lame walk. Lord, we believe that's the power of the cross, the power that's still working towards us today in Christ Jesus. And we receive this emblem with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. His blood that was shed for us. You know, when Jesus did this, he said, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. On Friday, hell celebrated his death. To borrow an old phrase, it was Friday, but Sunday was coming. It was dark on Friday. The other team thought they won, but it wasn't over. Instant replay was not needed. They didn't know the game actually went into overtime because it was still being played when Jesus was buried. When the Bible says he descended, and he led captivity captive, and he came out of the, the grave with the keys, the authority over death, hell, and the grave, because his blood was shed for us. And in that sacrifice is our victory today. And Lord, we thank you that every time we proclaim the Lord's death, we also proclaim his resurrection and the power of resurrection life that's working in us on this Easter Sunday morning, this resurrection day, resurrection celebration day. We thank you that you died, that your blood was shed, and that you live again so that we might have life. We receive this emblem with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Church, I want to give you another opportunity before we leave here to lift up your hands to celebrate and thank God for the work of Jesus at Calvary. Would you stand to your feet? Come on, I'm believing that as we do this here in just a minute, that people are healed, that there's gonna be testimonies of healing that's taken place, not because somebody's laid hands on you, but because God has confirmed his word as it was released with signs and wonders. I'm telling you, I believe that God in this very moment is working miracles of healing in physical bodies. So as we express this praise in just a minute, I want you to extend your faith for whatever miracle it is you need in your body to be made manifest in this moment because we're gonna declare that his cross was more than enough. It was more than enough. It just didn't save you. It healed you, it delivered you, and it set you free. So I want somebody to begin to lift up your voice and lift up a shout to Jesus, our deliverer. 